just so that we have. Can everybody see this OK? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To make sure that we can. Uh, that we have. Uh, my slides because I'm going to be uh, talking through some stuff and then also uh, presenting a little, a little bit of uh, evidence from my research. So uh, thank you uh, for having me uh, and uh, thank you, Sarah, for um, the uh, introduction. Um, so uh, just a, a little bit of background for uh, what got me started uh, thinking about uh, waiting time and how it contributes to inequality and then how it uh, is kind of an important uh, uh, thing for uh, public service to engage with a little bit more. Uh, so my um, partner, it's uh, funny, someone mentioned being on the phone with the optometrist. Uh, so my partner uh, went to uh, an eye appointment uh, and was uh, stuck for what she thought was going to be a, a, a 10 to 15 minute wait tops to get some new glasses and was stuck there for several hours. It was this huge delay, disrupted her day. She came back and she was venting about it. And then we were thinking on it and we were talking about um, how many of the other patrons in the in the eye shop didn't, um, the eyeglass shop didn't seem too bothered by this. It seemed very kind of normal for them. And uh, yet she was like very anxious and stressed about it. Uh, and she also volunteers to help uh, low-income women uh, get grants for uh, health services to cover health services. So it involves coordinating a lot of uh, 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 meetings with clinics and things like that and scheduling with clinics. And she was talking about how uh, when she's working with these low-income women, oftentimes they have to set aside an entire day for their appointment. It just It's this huge hassle. They end up waiting in lobbies for uh, hours at a time. And it's just something that didn't really occur to us uh, all that much because for us going to the doctor, we have maybe a at most a 40 minute wait. Uh, uh, and so I started thinking, I wonder if this is a systematic thing. If low income people just are disproportionately affected by waiting time. Uh, so I, I took advantage of some data that I happen to know about from other work that I've done on uh, uh, time use and how, how people spend their time. And it turns out there is, uh, you know, I'm not going to hide the ball. There is uh, a uh, income gap in the time that people are kept waiting for services. Uh, so I'll, I'll get there eventually, but uh, I just kind of wanted to give context for where this came from, uh, how I started thinking about it. Uh, and then I wrote up a, a paper that dug a little bit deeper than my kind of informal analysis with uh, my colleague Katie Vinipal, who is an assistant professor at Ohio State University. Uh, so I think some of us uh, might be aware of uh, time poverty, the concept of time poverty and how it's kind of gained a lot of attention uh, uh, recently. And time poverty uh, is a situation in which people don't have enough discretionary time uh, beyond uh, doing their mandatory things, things like work, ch caring for children, caring for seniors. Uh, eating, sleeping, all the basic things that we have to do in a day. Uh, and this is something that actually can affect uh, rich and poor people alike. It's not something that's exclusive to, to uh, low-income folks. Uh, High-income people can also experience a lot of, of time poverty. They just have commitments that are above and beyond uh, what the, the amount of time that they have in a day. And the... Uh, the issue with this kind of time poverty is that you end up making slightly suboptimal decisions in, in how you allocate your time because something has to give. Uh, in order to fit in uh, everything, you might cut sleep, which leads to health problems and, and mental health problems. Uh, you might cut exercise. You know, things start to get cut that are uh, actually important in the long run, right? Uh, you start making short run decisions that in the long run are actually not terribly helpful. So. Uh, we are actually interested in kind of a related concept, which is time inequality. And the way we're thinking about this is we're thinking about differences across groups in the autonomy that they have over their time. And this is where waiting time is, is actually useful to think about this, is it's a particularly unproductive activity. Nobody's able to work. You're not able to get the benefits of leisure. You're not able to ex exercise while you wait, although that would be wonderful. Uh, you're just kind of stuck and you're stuck on somebody else's schedule. Uh, and 
we all experience it, but if it's systematically impacting uh, low income groups, then you might imagine that this contributes to a variety of different uh, uh, inequalities in an ongoing way and in an, a long run way. So, um, for instance, if this kind of lack of autonomy over your time also kind of leads to additional time poverty, then it's not even time poverty that you are at least getting compensated for uh, through whatever you have in your schedule. It's you're facing time poverty that is a function of somebody else's, uh, you know, uh, control over your time. Uh, so a lot of uh, uh, authors have kind of, in, especially in recent years, started to think about this. Uh, and and uh, autonomy that people have over time and inequality and what that means uh, for society and what that means normatively. Uh, and uh, the problem that a lot of these authors run into is that it's hard to observe things like waiting time because uh, you have to go into a place and just watch wait time. So you can only do it at, at relatively small scales. Uh, you might have the the issue of when you go into, say, a uh, social work office and uh, people are coming in uh, and they have to wait, well, that's a di systematically different set of people than uh, uh, the full population. So that's mostly low income folks. There's not going to be a lot of wealthy folks going into the social uh, social welfare office. And so uh, you're, you're going to have maybe a distorted sense of waiting time overall. Maybe high income folks use different services that require a lot of waiting. Uh, and so we really wanted to look and see how systematic is this gap? Is there this like a, a, a big meaningful gap in time spent waiting between low income and high income people? So why do we care about waiting time? Like who, who cares? Uh, well, generally, I, I kind of touched on this a bit in the intro, but there's, there's a, a variety of reasons. Time is scarce. Uh, and autonomy is important for uh, uh, people's flourishing. So uh, oftentimes uh, people can make pretty decent decisions for themselves on uh, how much leisure they need, how much sleep they need, the obligations that they need to cover. And so when you're, uh, you're, you lack autonomy over your time, you might end up making less optimal decisions uh, in the time that you do have discretion over. Uh, waiting time also reflects differences in how uh, society values time, people's time. So if different groups are subject to less autonomy over their time, you might imagine that uh, uh, that's signaling something that in and of itself is somewhat stressful. It's signaling, look, your time is less valuable to me than other people's time. Uh, and, you know, differential treatment is obviously an equity issue that we should all, all care about no normatively. Uh, but also, as I kind of alluded to, time scarcity shapes physical and mental health uh, in what gets cut. And there's a lot of, from the time, you know, time poverty work, there's a lot of evidence that people that are time poor end up cutting things like exercise, sleep, uh, healthy food, because a lot of healthy food takes a little bit longer to prepare. Uh, it takes a little bit longer to uh, uh, shop for and maintain a, a good uh, stock of in your own kitchen. Think about uh, uh, the difference between having a diet of fruits and vegetables uh, you know, that necessitates going to the store a couple of times a month, several times a week even. Uh, and when you think about processed foods, they, they're shelf stable. They can just sit there all the time, right? So if you're time poor, you might opt for the more shelf stable foods, which has an obvious public health impact. Uh, it has a, 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 an obvious policy impact, especially if through waiting time, we're creating disproportionate time poverty uh, among low-income folks. Uh, recently, there's been a, a lot of attention paid to administrative burdens. Uh, this is particularly common. I, I, I'm less familiar, admittedly, with how common this is in the UK, but this is particularly common in the US. Uh, there's a, a lot of uh, social benefits have deep, detailed forms that uh, people have to fill out. And because we have a federated system, state governments will often add additional paperwork to programs that are at least federally financed. So you end up having wild uh, differences even across states in the kinds of things that people have to, to uh, submit just to get benefits for which they're eligible, right? Uh, 
Uh, and th this is particularly problematic because it ends up cutting off certain margins of the population from support that they should be getting, right? We've, we've made collective decisions to say, look, we should provide additional help for, for those in need. And then we use these kind of backdoor ways to cut off uh, uh, that help from some populations simply through things like paperwork, things like having to show up at an office and having an understaffed office that you show up to, uh, leading to long wait times. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that that delays in getting appointments can widen inequality. So there's these interesting field experiments that have shown uh, that um, both by income and by race, requests for appointments uh, for health services uh, actually uh, led to these huge gaps in response time. So uh, two people uh, with randomly fictional people with randomly assigned uh, backgrounds and randomly assigned income request appointments. And uh, there's a long wait just to get an appointment response from a health office for low income individuals. And it's even uh, present among uh, black Americans relative uh, in the middle class relative to white Americans in the middle class. So uh, income can't even uh, overcome the kind of race gaps that that we see in this in this kind of thing. Uh, and finally, as I kind of alluded to previously, these kinds of unequal waiting times leaves less productive time available for low income people who obviously taking away productive time from them means that uh, th they might end up on on these kinds of, of treadmills where uh, just to get the benefits they need, they end up spending so much time that they can't focus on maybe getting back into the labor market or uh, maybe uh, supervising their children or working on their own education. There's a variety of different things that you you could end up uh, uh, making harder on on low income people that we're, we're actually trying to help uh, in general. Uh, and then the other aspect of waiting time that I think uh, uh, gets a little bit less attention, but but probably should, is that waiting time is actually additionally costly for low income people, even if the, the waiting time was equal between low and high income people. Uh, low income people are often working on hourly schedules, right? And so they have less autonomy over their work life. They have less autonomy over their scheduling. And so you have this kind of structural economy that low income people are facing and a wait time for them has a, a, a monetary cost that uh, higher income people don't necessarily face. Uh, I'm a salaried employee. If I were to stand up right now and leave this, this uh, uh, meeting rudely in the middle of a meeting and go to an appointment, I would still get paid. My, my salary wouldn't be deducted for that time. Uh, but a low income person would have to take a shift off. They would have to, to pay an opportunity cost. Uh, and then finally, the additional part of waiting time uh, that's, that's relatively interesting is that this is not something that people necessarily opt into and often might reflect neighborhood inequality. So there's uh, a lot of, of interesting recent work done, uh, particularly in the US uh, context, but I, I I think there's been some some recent evidence from the UK as well that the neighborhood in which you grow up uh, actually determines a lot of your adult earnings. So if you grow up in a relatively low income neighborhood, uh, you have a much higher chance of remaining low income uh, than uh, um, if you grow up in a high income neighborhood. Uh, and this is in part just a, a function of, of the quality of services and the expectations that that are set for you. Uh, about the kinds of services that you should receive. So there's a lot of, of, of reasons why we think waiting time is important. We think uh, uh, generally decision making is going to be really uh, 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 bad when people are hassled to uh, uh, fulfill their, their daily needs. And so if shopping in, uh, requires you to go into the queue and wait 20 minutes because there's only one register open because you're in a low income neighborhood. And so you have uh, low quality uh, grocers serving your neighborhood. Um, then 
you're going to end up putting off shopping as much as possible just to try and save on this wedding uh, waiting time. And you might make suboptimal decisions in the kinds of foods that you eat, uh, which leads to a lot of other spillover inequalities. So we try to get at this in a systematic way by looking at uh, data from the American Time Use Survey. And there's actually an, uh, uh, a version that uh, uh, in England uh, that collects an analogous uh, time diary data uh, from the UK that I, I haven't had a chance to dig into, but would love to. Uh, and the important aspect of this is that it's a nationally representative sample of Americans and it's collected each year. And it collects a retrospective time diary of how respondents spent their previous 24 hours in 15 minute blocks. And this is important because if you go out and you ask people in, in uh, a conventional survey, how much time did you spend exercising yesterday? Well, we all know that we're supposed to exercise more than we do. We all know that exercising is, is, is a good thing. Uh, and so we might say, oh, I spent, I spent an hour at the gym yesterday. Uh, but in actuality, we spent 30 minutes at the gym or zero time at the gym. And really what we're doing is we know that this survey item is specifically targeting exercise. And so we want to look good to the, to the surveyor and uh, because it's asking about a specific thing, we're kind of being guided to think about the social desirability of that thing. Uh, time diary data evades this because it makes no ask of, of um, specific activities. It just says, every 15 minutes, what were you doing? And people fill out their time diaries. You can aggregate this. And it gives you a picture of how the typical American is spending their time on a typical day. Uh, and then this data is actually linked to a lot of data on things like education, economic information, family information, et cetera. Uh, so we have this window from 2003 to 2019. I, I did, so they, they just released the pandemic year batch of this data. Uh, and I did take like a, a brief look at it uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and all of the results here, you can actually see in somewhat surprisingly in the pandemic year as well. Uh, and we, we could talk about that maybe a little bit later as to why that might be. Uh, so we look at the gaps in time spent waiting for services generally. So we look at health, we combine a bunch of services just to get a holistic picture. And then we look at some services that are more commonly used uh, uh, in, in detail. So uh, separately. So we look at waiting for things like health, legal services, that, that's things like going to court, paying tickets, blah, 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 uh, government services broadly, retail, childcare, schooling, adult care, home maintenance, all of the things that are, are common services that we need to just to, to survive daily life. And we, because of all the rich data that this is linked to, we can control for things like race and gender, educational background, yada, yada, yada. I don't want to spend too much time getting into the weeds on this, but uh, we can condition to try and make respondents as comparable as possible, except for their income. Uh, and so then we look at low income respondents. Uh, the federal poverty line for a family of four is around 22,000 in our in our window. Uh, so we, we look at low income respondents defined as 20K or less, high income respondents 150K or more. It doesn't actually get more granular. Uh, than that above 150k in the data, uh, so that that was we were kind of forced on on that by the nature of the data. Uh, so what do we find? Well, we see that there's actually an income gap in the time that people spend waiting for services, uh, and the gap is is not particularly small. It it we're talking about this is among people that spent a little bit of time waiting. They they had some non-zero wait time, and low-income people spend more time waiting when waiting occurs than high income people. And this is particularly striking because high income people also select out of some waiting. So uh, they're less likely to wait at all. Uh, and that's because you can imagine some obvious explanations. They can do online shopping. Uh, they can choose higher quality services. They can optimize uh, the time of day that they go to, to conduct their business because they have more flexibility in their schedule. A lot of different explanations for this, but this comes out to about 
uh, uh, 12 minutes in a typical day, additional waiting for low income people. And I'll, I'll circle back to why that's a, a bigger deal than, than it facially appears. So health services, it gets even bigger. So when we think about things like um, uh, going to the doctor, low income people are spending about 20 minutes more in a typical day waiting for health services than a high income person, uh, which given uh, kind of what I was discussing before about how this might shape future decisions, this is a real problem because if if we are we care about public health and we care about equity in the quality of health care that people receive, uh, people might be less likely to go to preventative care appointments, just standard physicals, standard preventative care, uh, if they are going to spend a ton of time of their life waiting uh, in the lobby or waiting to, to get an appointment. Uh, now, I, I want to point out that all of these gaps exclude transit. So they include the time it took to travel to a place, but it does not include things like waiting at the bus stop, waiting at the train stop. It's just total time traveling. Uh, so I can account for that. But if we were to actually separate out waiting for transit uh, and, and we were able to actually add this to the waiting gap, it would almost certainly be larger. Uh, so we look at, at shopping. This helps us get at a sense of, of how much of this is, is neighborhood quality uh, because ev everybody has to shop. We have to shop regularly. And again, even in grocery shopping, we can see that low-income people end up waiting longer at the grocery store. And like I said, this has public health effects because we might worry about uh, uh, some less optimal and less healthy eating decisions being made as a result of trying to avoid this kind of headache of going to the store. Similar to the field experiments that are looking at uh, things like how long it takes to get an appointment on the calendar, uh, we can see that Black Americans actually uh, have the same waiting gap uh, that among high income black Americans that we see in low income black Americans. In other words, income doesn't seem to, while, while white, Hispanic, Asian Americans all get this kind of income benefit where the higher income they are, the more likely they are to receive uh, uh, better services, faster services. For black Americans, income doesn't seem to to help much. Uh, finally, I, I, I just want to go quickly through time of day. And this is important when we think about things like uh, scheduling and flexibility and uh, uh, especially staffing services. So uh, you can see that there's not a big gap during the day between low income and high income individuals. It's all in the evenings and in the mornings, uh, which to me uh, suggests that the, the likely story here is, well, in the mornings and, the, in, and in the evenings, there, there's a big rush. And if low-income people are systematically facing lower quality services uh, that end up uh, optimizing on, on you know, lower labor costs, right? Uh, those lower labor costs mean that in rush hours before and after work, uh, there's going to be a higher wait time for anybody that's using those services. And so what ends up happening is that that staffing decision leads to these huge gaps in uh, time spent waiting for things. And it's true both in the weekdays and on the weekends, which again uh, strikes me as kind of a compelling case that at least some of this is being done through uh, uh, neighborhood sorting and neighborhood design. So when we think about things like uh, uh, what can public servants do about this? Well, we need to think about the ways in which uh, uh, planning our cities, planning our communities, zoning, housing policy, all of these intersect in ways that influence neighborhood quality and the distribution of high and low income people across neighborhoods. So on a typical day, uh, the, the basic summary here is that on a typical day, low income Americans spend about 12 minutes more waiting for services. It's about 18 minutes more when we look at just health services. Uh, High income people can also trade income to avoid waiting at all. Uh, this is uh, kind of what I was getting at in, in talking about the selection here. But this gap is a little bit deceptive. Uh, if we think about using just three services per week, 
and three services per week involve some amount of waiting. That means low-income Americans are losing an additional 26 to 31 hours a year just to the additional wait time. Uh, that means an additional unproductive amount of time is being taken from them just for waiting for services each year. 31 hours, that's uh, nearly a 40-hour work week, right? Uh, that's the first uh, uh, part of your vacation. Imagine losing 31 hours of your vacation uh, days uh, just to just to waiting around for, for additional services. Uh, but waiting time can also lead to avoiding kind of important appointments or putting them off. Uh, so th these kinds of gaps are, are important for just so many reasons, but one of them is just an equity concern in the outcomes that we all care about for uh, the, the public that we're trying to serve. Um, and finally, I just want to close by noting, again, the gap is largest in the mornings and evenings. So th this to me is, is uh, in, in some part, a, a staffing story. So uh, we know, for instance, uh, from a lot of uh, uh, queuing theory, uh, theory about like how people wait and what that, what that uh, leads to uh, in terms of staff, the difference between having one staff member running a, uh, a, a wait desk, a welcome desk, and two staff members is exponential, not linear, right? So uh, going from zero to one means that you would have to have, a, uh, or I mean, from one to two means that you would have to have an additional uh, triple or quadruple amount of volume to have the same wait time. So it's important to think about the amount of slack that we are building in our uh, organizations, in our services, uh, to deal with especially uh, peak hours of, of, of service time and appointment time. So I'm going to uh, kind of end it there and, and uh, open it up for discussion, questions, things that people are thinking about, uh, uh, how people have, have thought about this in, in uh, uh, their jobs.